I find it sad that some people do find it difficult to raise questions about scripture. I think the historical Jesus had the passion of a social prophet. Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He died because of the sins of the world. Compassion was at the center of Jesus' ministry and life. As we share, we experience God's love. There's nothing about the Christian life that says it is not a journey. It's ultimately a journey into the mystery of God. A revisioning of Christianity is already emerging in the world, and it's motivated in part by taking the Bible seriously and not literally. Only Matthew and Luke provide us nativity accounts, and the nativity accounts that they give us do not agree. The genealogies do not agree. How they land in Bethlehem, that's not consistent. In Matthew, they're already there. In Luke, they get there by means of a census. The census itself that Luke talks about does not seem to have historical backing. I find it sad that some people do find it difficult to raise questions about Scripture. Jesus didn't ask people to give up their minds. He asked for your, your, your heart. I think the historical Jesus had the passion of a social prophet. Jesus of history is uh, one who is passionate about the least of these. But I think the church has sometimes, maybe more often than not in its history, used the story of Jesus not to um, uh, include people and not for the sake of the least of these, but has frequently used the story of Jesus to judge people, to exclude people, even to beat up on people, uh, especially infidels, the non-Christians throughout like the Middle Ages and so forth. But also it continues in our own time. What is the right way? Once I thought I found the right way, of course that meant everyone else was wrong. Now, here's my struggle. I'm amazed at how I have evolved theologically. The more I grow, the less I seem to be certain about. This is a great struggle for me. And so people ask me in my congregation, what about this or that? And I say, honey, I don't know. <laughs> they say, you don't know, but you're the pastor. I say, yeah, but I still don't know. There is no question in my mind that had there not been some transforming experience that happened to the disciples after the death of Jesus that convinced them that he had conquered the boundary of human death, there would be no Christianity. Uh, we've long said that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He died because of the sins of the world. I happen to believe the old notion that God must beat the living daylights of it, out of his own kid in order to be able to forgive us of our sins merely portrays the divine as an abusive parent. When the prophet Micah observed that ritual had become an end in itself in Israel, he determined that the people had lost the essence of their faith. Without justice, human beings cannot live together as God intended. Without kindness and mercy, life is unbearable. And unless one walks humbly in the presence of the mystery we call God, we are likely to be humbled in ways we least expect. And so Micah poses the question that stands at the heart of Jesus' ministry. And what does the Lord require of you but, but to, to do justice, justice and, and to, to love, love kindness, kindness and to walk and to humbly with your God? Jesus' life was about living out Micah's call. We don't prove our faith in God by blind and unquestioning duty to rules. Blind obedience to rules, in fact, gets in the way of faith because the temptation is to mistake the rules for God. As we share, we experience God's love. We experience the presence of Christ Jesus. I'm very mindful of the fact that indeed Christ walks among the poor. And so compassion in that situation is being open to seeing the face of Christ and receiving the blessing of being in communion with someone who, who hungers, but who probably knows God in very deep and profound ways. Compassion was at the center of Jesus' ministry and life. So often in the gospel, you get the sense that that Jesus looked into people's eyes, into their hearts, and he saw something. He saw who they were. He saw what they needed. 
and no matter what law he had to break, if he had to break a law in order to make that person whole, to make their lives better, Jesus did. There's a wonderful story from a 9th century Muslim holy person, a woman named Rabia. She tells about an angel walking down the street with a bucket of water in hand and an axe in the other hand. And somebody says, what are you doing with that bucket of water and that axe? And the angel says, with this bucket of water, I'm going to put out the fires of hell. And with this axe, I'm going to chop down the mansions of heaven and then we'll see who loves God. If we are Christian, or if we love God primarily because we want to go to heaven, we have not advanced very far in that path of dying to an old way of being and being born into a new way of being, where our concern is not primarily our individual selves. As people have been given permission to ask the tough questions, everything changes. Every question we ask without receiving a satisfactory answer makes us more adept at honing our questions. The Christian life is a journey, and people ought to enjoy the journey. The people that think they've arrived are the ones that always get us in trouble. Anytime somebody thinks the journey's over and they finally achieve the truth, they always put their wagons in a circle and begin to defend the truth against all comers, and in the process, they kill one another. There's nothing about the Christian life that says it is not a journey. It's ultimately a journey into the mystery of God. Even though one can point to countless examples of political and theological spin that are anything but holy, the Bible has established itself in our culture as a source of inspired, not dictated, guidance and observation. Although it's a flawed and imperfect window, it was fashioned by people of faith who have helped generations of seekers catch a glimpse of the mystery beyond. Progressive Christians can claim a distinctive voice in the 21st century by being in solidarity with the poor, countering the idolatry of wealth, practicing nonviolence, and by seeking justice and inclusivity in a culture dominated by suspicion and fear. In doing so, we may discover that the path of true wisdom is not just asking the questions for which there are no answers, but in living the questions which shape our faith, our lives, and our world.